We'll continue on. Uh, this will be the blood covenant part seven. Blood covenant part seven. Uh, in 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 the old scriptures or in Bible times, the the covenant was a matter of life and death. And the reason I'm going there is because I told you last week we we're, we're going to talk about that blood today. And it, when it was a matter of life and death, it was shown in the death of the covenant animal. And, uh, you know, the oath taken by the two parties and the shedding of the blood, uh, or the shedding of their own blood. And for God to make the new covenant, the representative, you know, we've looked at that man, the, the representative man, the, the God man, Jesus, had to shed his own blood and death and, rise, and raise out of death and bring, uh, bring us the blessing of the new covenant in the authority. And see, this is it, in the authority of his shed blood. And here, here's a verse now the, uh, in Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. But when I'm looking at this, and, and you know, I, I used to wonder this picture, what's all this obsession with, with, with death uh, that's involved in this shedding of blood? You realize the millions and millions of animals that were sacrificed? I mean, I don't know how many were sacrificed in Solomon when he dedicated the temple. My Lord. Tens of thousands in one day. I mean, they just must have had every priest out there just cutting as fast as they, they could go. I mean, why did the love of God finally focus in the shedding of the blood of Jesus? And from the beginning of the Bible to the end, we, we see this blood. There's enough in the Old Testament for a daggone river uh, from the animals that were slain. Uh, just on the, the daily sacrifices. And in the New Testament, the uh, central celebration is in giving glory to the blood of Jesus Christ that fulfilled it. And we read this scripture the other day in, in, uh, in our praise and worship. Here's Revelation uh, chapter 5. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. I mean, this is where the whole praise and worship was based on. And to open the seals thereof, for thou, because thou wast slain. I mean, the, the whole reason for the praise and worship here that took place in the heaven was because of the slain of the Lamb. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. How? By the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, here's something, that, and I know you guys know this. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but the shedding of blood is not only in the Bible. It's in other cultures that are far removed from one another. I mean, we see this set up in the Aztecs who were in, I mean, where did they get it? They, didn't, they weren't Hebrews. They didn't have a covenant, but yet, I mean, they was offering sacrifices, blood. Where did the idea of come from and now anthropologists will tell you that it originated in, in the fear of the supernatural uh, the belief that an angry God demanded uh, to be appeased with blood but the Bible gives us a different picture and we're going to go to Le Leviticus and uh, you know when I'm looking at this anthropologists, I, I could probably say most preachers instead of anthropologists because most preachers believe God is mad or on the verge of being mad or at your very next step he, he could be mad. Maybe he's happy right now but if you mess up again there's some blood that's, that's you know that's got to be shed. And that's the reason I wanted to go in and look at this covenant because I mean there's just scriptures now that just jump off the page uh, you know, like that, like that scripture. We'll come back to Leviticus, but uh, here in Second Corinthians, and and you know, I never read this, but 
uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. I mean, do you ever just look at that? Not imputing their <coughs> trespasses to them. We don't hear that preached today. <coughs> and see, we're going to find out the only way this could be so. The only way Paul could say this is through that blood. And I'm not talking the blood of bulls and goats. There had to be something more powerful than that. And that's, that's what we're going to look at. Leviticus 17. Let's start with verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for, for the soul. What makes an atonement? The blood is what makes the atonement for the soul. And he says it right here. The life of the flesh is what? In the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat any blood, nor shall a stranger that sojourner among you eat blood. For, and whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or the strangers that sojourner among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. In other words, it had to be buried. The blood had to be buried. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood. God owns all life and the blood in which it is contained. Therefore throughout the Bible, all blood, animal and human, was regarded as sacred. It could never be eaten. When they buried this blood, when they killed whatever, and they, they covered it with dust, they did it with reverence. I mean, could you imagine having a funeral for a groundhog? <laughs> but, I mean, you know, because it was sacred. We know back in Genesis, God's first response to the sin of man was to give them the gift of animal sacrifice in which we know the sacred lifeblood of the animal was shed, being poured out on behalf of the sinner that was now under the penalty of death. The, the animal literally took the place of the sinner. And, and we know that that, uh, that sin, that, that wasn't... See, and this is what... I wish people could get out of the mindset of, of sin as being a thing or an action. It was their entire condition. You know the thing Raymond was talking about, Adam and Christ. It was the entire condition of that man. It didn't matter what he did from then on. He was under that, he was from now on in that condition of death, separated from God. That was his condition. There was, I mean, that was it. But in that animal sacrifice, we know that, that that was placed upon the animal as the, as the sinner's substitute. And then the animal's sacred lifeblood was poured out. The life of the substituted animal was yielded up in death by the shedding of blood to the one whom against the crime had been, uh, the crime had been committed or the sin had been committed. Now the principle of this uh, substitutionary sacrifice wasn't revealed in detail until it was spelled out in, in the law of Moses. It was there, but it was you know kind of hidden away. But now it's coming into view more. But how could the blood of an animal have any effect upon your sin? Because we're looking at this thing. We're in Leviticus. We're, we're back there. There was no virtue in the blood of an animal to cover sin. So where do we look for the effectiveness of animal blood through 
through the centuries before Jesus came because it did have effect. Where, where do we find that? Now to understand that, we have to look backwards. Now, it was already seen in the heart of God before time. God determined in covenant love to create man and to have man share in his life. Even though he knew what man would do. You know. He knew what Adam would do. It wasn't a, a surprise. It was purposed. That the Father would send the Son who would join our humanity in its in our sinful condition, taking our place, bearing the sin in his own body, pouring out his own life, blood for us and as us. Now, let me just let me show you here. I'll just give you a couple of scriptures here. First Peter 1 and 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish or spot, who barely was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And then Revelation 13 and 8 says, a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. But So this, this ultimate gift of the sacrifice of God, the Son, was, was pictured and anticipated in the gift of the blood of the animal sacrifices. Now, here's where this thing comes into view. Well, let me say this. Apart from those sacrifices pointing to Christ, they meant less than zero. The blood of animals couldn't take away sin. God, God was put off by the sacrifices that were presented as a ritual. You, you see, because... And, and, and I'll show you. Look here in Isaiah. Isaiah uh, 1 and 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? I'm full of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed, uh, of fed beast, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the lambs or of the egos. You see what I mean? They had just become a religious, a religious ritual. They, they had quit anticipating. They had quit hoping. They had quit looking to what they stood for. And, you know, it's like church. Say the sinner's prayer. I mean, we're not looking at Christ. We're not looking at the life or, uh, you know, we're just doing our rituals. Doing our rituals. Those animal sacrifices had significance admitted only because they shadowed the ultimate sacrifice that was already accomplished in the heart of God before creation. <clears throat> but the benefits of the blood of Jesus was present to the worshipers in the Old Testament by virtue of the fact that he was slain in the heart of God before there was an Old Testament. Every animal sacrifice, what it was doing was preparing the people for the ultimate sacrifice, for the coming of Christ. For God the Son to become the ultimate substitute for his man. Now we know back over here in Genesis, in, in, the, in the first sin, that God gave a sacrifice to Adam gave a sacrifice in love. And he gave the first promise uh, of, a, of a descendant or a seed that would come and crush the head of the serpent. Crush the head of the lie. God, uh, you know what Adam and them did? I mean, you know the story. They went out and hid themselves in fig leaves. God replaced the fig leaves with coats of skin. And, and, of course, you know that in that, the animal had to die. They didn't put a living fox on their neck. You know, the animal had to die. So, was it just a matter of clothes? I mean, if so, what was wrong with the fig leaves they already had? Something was the matter with the fig leaves. This one, 
If it was only about covering nakedness, then the fig leaves would have served its purpose because they did that. So it had more to do with, with, with what these things were pointing to. And the key is the fig leaves was directly connected with the sin and their attempts to hide its results. By giving them another covering, the Lord is saying uh, that the fig leaf was inadequate to deal with the situation. And that situation, of course, sin had left them in a state of death. And in that state of death, the immediate sensations of that was guilt and shame, fear. So something was more drastically needed than just fig leaves. I mean, the fig leaves temporarily covered the shame and made them respectable in one another's presence. I'm not talking in the presence of God, but for Adam and Eve, now they can be in each other's presence, right? They're covered up. They're respectable. But it couldn't deal with the guilt or the cause of it. They were dead. They were in a state of death. So God's first gift outside of giving them life was a sacrificial animal. That would shed its blood and death and give them coats made of skins to cover their nakedness. You ever just go back and read and, and think that here's Adam and Eve in the garden. They have never seen death. They don't know what death is. They've never seen nothing die. Nothing. And then this happens and, and the guilt and the shame and now all of a sudden an animal. They've never seen blood. And all of a sudden for the first time blood is shed an animal is skinned out and given to them to cover them. Can you imagine the horror of that? See, we're so calloused nowadays. It's just... This thing had to leave an impression on them. It had to leave a mark. They couldn't forget that God had rejected their fig leaves, right? I mean, you know, there had to be this place, hey... God rejected this. We had to put those off. And now we have to put this on. He rejected that. He demanded the shedding of blood to cover the results of sin. And in that, God was acting as priest on behalf of the, of, of the sinful people, Adam and Eve, and made the first sacrifice. So man, from that moment on, would never forget that when approaching God, he had to approach God as those under the penalty of death. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, from this moment on, every approach to God had to be one as one under the curse, as one under the penalty. They, so they had to bring they had to bring the gift of the animal, which God even provided that gift. So then that brings us to Cain and Abel. And you guys, you guys know the story here. Cain Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain grew vegetables. He, was a, he grew veggies. Abel raised sheep. Now, it says in verse 3, in the process of time, that, 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 that little phrase right there means in the end of days. I've got it even in the margin, the end of days. And, and what I want to look, what that means is there was a specific time when they would bring their, uh, when they would come to worship God and bring their offering. There was a specific time. A number of days had passed, so there was a specific time uh, that they would come and bring their offering. They also brought their offering, it says, to the Lord. And meaning it was a specific place. And this specific place was probably the gates of the Garden of Eden, where the cherubim was. Because remember, they just left. Right? They were in the garden. Boom, they get kicked out of the garden. Here's the flaming sword that turns everywhere. That's, that's the gate to get back into the presence of God. 
from the, and so now they're separated. So now they're bringing their gift back to that spot. You, you see what I mean? Where the cherubim is. They're bringing their gift at a specific time because they realize they're under the penalty of death and they have to come and do this. But Abel's offering was accepted. Now everybody's going to tell you why. But I'm asking you, why was his offering accepted? Everybody said, well, he offered blood. I just read to you in Isaiah where God said, I'm full of the offerings that you give me. So it ain't got nothing to do with blood. He wasn't a vampire up there wanting blood. But why was Abel's offering accepted and Cain's wasn't? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, and here it is, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What does that mean by faith? Abel was looking into the future of what this blood or who this blood was representing. By faith, he was looking into Christ Jesus. You, you see what I mean? So it's not just about the blood. If it's not offered by faith, or, or we could say in view of Christ, then it means nothing, right? So Abel had a view of Christ. His offering was accepted. So, so, so biblical faith never initiates an action. It's a response uh, or a responsive act of trust in a word from God. What was Abel responding to? You see, you've got to read between the lines a little bit, but uh, what had been taught by his father concerning the first gift of the sacrifice that was ever given. The sacrifice that God had given them right there in the garden when they got kicked out. They were naked. God had shown Adam about the sacrifice. And Abel came with the blood of the lamb, which was... So which would suggest that the animal that God had slain and covered them in was a lamb. I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us, but since Abel brought a lamb and he was taught by Adam, his dad, it probably was a lamb because they were just following suit. But now here's old, uh, here's old Cain. Cain chose to be innovative. Uh, he rejected the plain word and, and the gift of God that was already given. Cain refused God's, deliberately refused the gift of the sacrifice. Plus he went back to what God had already rejected. God had rejected the fruit of the ground. Leaves of the fruit of the ground too. He had already rejected the fig leaves. Abel or Cain went back to that. Abel, brought, Abel brings the, the lamb appointed by God. Life that's poured out for sin. Cain brought the best that he could produce. Produced with his own hands, with his own sweat. Cain, Cain brought the harvest. The harvest. As if to say, thanks God for the provision. He forgot there was a lot more at stake than just saying thanks. Sin has to be faced and, and dealt with, and, and the results of sin can't be covered by a good harvest. Cain stood under the sentence of death. As a matter of fact, the whole human race stood under the sentence of death. And the only way out of it was for another to take his place. A life offered up, blood poured out on his behalf. So, we can't feel sorry for Cain here. You remember what the Lord said? If Cain, if you do well, you know, he's reminded him. If you do well, Cain, you'll be accepted. But if you don't, sin lies at the door. Sin's lying there like a wild animal ready to devour you. Look, look at this verse in, uh, in 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, slew his brother, and therefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous.
the works the verse talks about was the fruits he brought as an offering. That was the works that he had brought. That was what was called evil. He brought that of his own doing. It's called evil works. See, Cain was the first to go farther in sin than, than anyone else ever had, than, than Adam or than his parents. It's one thing to sin, but it's a greater evil to refuse the gift that God had, had already appointed. See, we get these things today. I'll just touch on this for a second. You know, here's all the big words. What if you blaspheme? You know, blaspheme the Holy Ghost. It, it's not forgiven. It's not forgiven. But we don't understand. We think blaspheme is a certain combination of words. And if you say them in this order, then you blaspheme. But the thing that, that's unforgiven and can't be forgiven is uh, simply not receiving the life of Jesus Christ. Because there's no forgiveness outside of him, and he's the only forgiveness. So blaspheme has to do has to to do, to do with receiving of him. If, you know, I mean that's that's the only sin, and that's that's what Cana did, and that's what Israel did, and all through scriptures they they wouldn't receive him. And and so. Cain's evil, our evil. It's the evil of man-made religion that seeks the way of salvation by the sweat of our own works, by the by the work of our hands. We try to please God. See, I mean, we did, I mean, we're we're there working as hard as we can, trying to make God happy when He's already provided a sacrifice. Now, these little stories right here, they're, they're the seeds from which the full understanding of the meaning of the sacrifice would finally come. The law of Moses developed these offerings into, into a, uh, and a system that gave us a better picture. And each sacrifice that was, was given was looking forward with hope, with expectation to the day when God would deal with sin once and for all. And this was brought into focus on the Day of Atonement. You know, here's another side note. You know, uh, most of the church will tell you that Passover was the cross. They'll say Passover's behind and most will say Pentecost, you know, birth of the church, the Holy Ghost came. But these other feasts, the Day of Atonement, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles, we still got out here in the future. Well, guys, I'm here to tell you, according to Israel, according to the Old Testament, their sins wasn't forgiven until the Day of Atonement. So if Christ didn't already accomplish this, in his cross, in his death, burial, and resurrection, in the day of atonement, had already come to pass. We are dead and yet in our seeds. You, you see what I mean? So if we try to put the Feast of Tabernacles out here into the future, then the day of atonement hasn't came yet because it's right slap dead middle, in the middle of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is what we're going to look at because this all came to focus in the Day of Atonement. And at the center of this ritual and sacrifice was the high priest. He was the representative. He was the mediator. Uh, on behalf of the, of the covenant people of Israel, he, he was the mediator. Now we know that when the high priest was symbolically wearing his, his, uh, his robe, his priestly robe, with his breastplate full of the stones, he symbolically was carrying Israel, not only on his heart, but on his shoulders, carrying them into the presence of God. And, and I think this is so beautiful too because... You know, next to his heart, 
put on his shoulders, meaning in his strength. He carried them in his strength. And then there wasn't just stones, but each one of those stones had the names written on them. There was a specific stone that said Issachar, Zebulon, Judah. You know what I mean? They would say, that's my stone right there. And, and all Israel would watch that high priest carry them into the presence of God, into that most holy place. And it was a, a picture to every Israelite that, that they knew that they were in the high priest. Right? They would look and they would say, that's my name right there. I'm in the high priest. Now all this came into focus on the Day of Atonement. Now on this specific day, all the offerings that had been offered all year long through, throughout the whole year were summed up in this one offering. Uh, and I always think it kind of odd that it's not a lamb here, but it's a goat. It's a goat. A goat that was to be sacrificed by the high priest on behalf of all the people. Now on this particular day, the high priest would take off his priestly robe, his garments. He would take those off where he's standing there in the, in the daily attire of Right? Just the average day, daily attire of the Levites in his white robe. They had brought two goats up. Both goats had been examined to be without spot and without blemish. One of the goats, they drew lots for the goats. One of the goats was chosen for death. Now, I just want you to get this picture. All Israel is standing there. Because if you didn't come to this place, you couldn't be a part of Israel anymore. All Everybody had to come. All Israel, millions of people are standing there. The high priest is standing there. The two goats, they drew lots. This goat is going to die. So we set this goat aside. This goat right here is chosen to die. Right? Everybody's looking at this goat. Now, the high priest, remember, all Israel knows that they're in the high priest. So the high priest takes his hands and lays on the head of the goat and starts confessing all the sins of the people. Now, this was symbolically transferring uh, uh, the condition of the people to the animal that's standing there. If you was in that crowd... As you heard the sin being confessed, you would realize, you know, I, I mean, I'm just, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, he's naming off all these sins, and he says, well, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Oakley did that one. I didn't do that one. <laughs> and then finally, he gets to the one, he says, oh, yeah, that's me. And I would realize that's the sin, that's, those are the sins. He's laid it on that goat. You, you see what I mean? So all, and you're just waiting. It's like, finally got to mine. Boom. Now it's transferred into that goat. <coughs> now see, this wasn't an empty ritual to the Israelites. <coughs> because they're there, man. They're waiting on their sin because they know they can't approach God. Sin's got to be dealt with. So they're there. I mean, they're there in a holy joy of anticipation waiting for this thing to take place. And they're, they're waiting on something. As they're watching... They say, now I'm not guilty anymore. The goat is guilty. And immediately, as soon as the, the high priest did that, as he raises his head up, he pulls out his knife, sticks it into the throat of the goat, slices its throat. <coughs> I mean, we don't get this picture. Now, immediately after that, as soon as the blood starts pouring out, remember the life is in the blood, he takes a big basin down there and catches all the blood in it. Now remember, we got this goat standing over here. He's the live goat. We got this goat right here that's chosen for death. He's dying, pouring out all of his blood into this bowl. The priest is standing there, not in his uh, other garments, but in his simple white robe. So now the priest immediately, remember, all Israel's watching. He's got the bowl. The goat is dead, right? All Israel. So now... Now we got to wonder, is God going to accept it, right? 
Is God going to accept this thing? So now, what's the high priest do now? The high priest got the blood that was in a bowl. Now this was a place back here that was off limits to everybody else. There was a veil there that separated them. We know inside of this place, because history tells us, you know, the ark was in there, and the cherubims, the mercy seat, the... Uh, and, on, and all the things that was in there. There was no natural light in there, but the glory of God that dwelt above the mercy seat. And isn't it amazing how that when he took the blood, that what he was looking at was a veil, the veil that had the very picture on it of the very thing that happened in the Garden of Eden because the veil itself was covered in the cherubim. So every time they would look at the veil, they would say, behind the veil is heaven. That's where God is. Because this is where Adam brought his sacrifices to. Adam brought his sacrifices to where the cherubim was. Because he knew God was on the other side. You, you see what I'm getting at? Man, man couldn't enter into the glorious presence of God. Not because, now listen to this, not because God didn't love them and God was an angry God and God would have to kill them and God needed blood and he's mad. No, that's not it. It was because man's sin had placed man, us, in a relationship to God that would cause our destruction. You see what I mean? Because God is holy, God is just, God is light. We had now become part of the darkness. What happens when you try to put darkness into light? Darkness is destroyed. So God in his great mercy sealed himself off from us so that he would destroy us. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? Not God up there angry, God I've got to have blood, I'm mad, I'm ticked off. God wanted a relationship with us and yeah. determined to be in our presence yeah. even if it had to be behind the veil. You, you see what I mean? So here goes this high priest carrying this blood. Now he walks behind the veil and he takes that blood and sprinkles it all over the mercy seat. Now we're seeing this for one time, but you know guys, this went over thousands of years. Every year. Could you imagine how many trips the high priest had made? In? Could you imagine how much blood is on this mercy seat? Because there's no scriptures where they said we're going to have a church clean today and everybody's going to go in there and wipe all the blood off the mercy seat. There was old, crusty blood dried all over this thing for thousands of years. He took all that blood in there and throwed it all over that mercy seat. It was covered over in blood. And this blood, this, this blood was the symbolic registry that God, or before God, that one more time the sin of the people was covered. The blood-stained mercy seat was the promise of the, of the blood of the final offering that would that wouldn't merely cover sin, but take it away forever. Every Every sprinkling on that mercy seat, every year, every sprinkling on that mercy seat was a promise. It was an IOU given by God to God that awaited payment in the blood of Jesus. But then he comes back out. Well, there's another goat right here, right? What are we going to do with this thing? This is unlike any of the other sacrifices. There's, a, there's another part to it. So now we got the living goat. Now the living goat wasn't chosen for the sacrifice. So here again, the high priest goes up to the living goat, lays its hands on its head, again confesses the sins of all the people onto the living goat. The living goat was then taken out to the wilderness and led away sent away, never to return. Now why, you ever wonder why the second goat, what does it mean? Was the first goat not, not get it done? 
Remember what's taking place here. Where's God? God's back here. God is sealed off from you. A veil is there, right? So the people out here don't know that their sins and iniquities are removed. Because God's over here. So the purpose of the living goat is to show in the eyes of all the people what is actually in the eyes of God. That their sins and iniquity I will remember no more. You, you see what I mean? Because at this time there's still this separation. So the purpose of the living goat being driven away was for the people to actually see. If you, Because if you would have come up at that particular juncture and said, Jim, where is your sin? I would say, I don't know what you're talking about. Because I would know that the sin that I had done, the sin of who I am was put on that goat, and that goat was led away never to come back. You couldn't find it. You could look and look and look and look, but it couldn't be found. So that's that was the imagery that was that was given. Uh, their sin was was covered; it was lost from the eyes of God, and they could they could, would be there rejoicing. But here's here's the thing: as dramatic as this ritual was, their sin it had been covered. Uh, It didn't deal with sin. It only brought sin to remembrance. It was a gift from God, but it was a weak system. You know, we've discussed all that. It was weak. Animal life could never be a substitute for human, human life. Why? Because we were made in the image of God. Plus, the animal victims weren't willing substitutes. They didn't give themselves in love. They wasn't led to the altar in obedience. So every year, the Day of Atonement had to be repeated. It could never be finished until, until the one it pointed to came to finish that work. And in the Holy of, Holy of Holies, we know there was no chair in there. The high priest never got to sit down in that place. After he sprinkled the blood, there was no place to sit down. Why couldn't he sit down? Because sin had been put away. It, it was only covered. It was only, only uh, promised. And that's why here, listen to this in, uh, in Hebrews. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the, the comers there unto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a what? A remembrance. Again, made of sins every year. Now remember, we're talking about covenant. Now isn't the church always preaching about sin and sin and sin and sin and sin? But in here he says, all that does is bring sin to remembrance. We've got to get by this thing. We've got to put off the, these things. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but what? But a body hast thou prepared me. I'm just going to skip over to verse 11. And every high priest, day of atonement, standing daily, ministering, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man. But this man. And I'm just going to leave that right there. Can you imagine Israel, 1,500 years of Day of Atonement, and the, and the live goat, and the sacrifice goat, and all of these things that was going on, the law of Moses, and they coming up. From, could you imagine Jeremiah coming about saying, in that day, I'll give you a new covenant. 
Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. What? You mean there's going to come a day when we won't have to repeat the day of atonement? Ezekiel, I'll sprinkle clean water on you, wash you. What? A day when, when I'm washed, I won't have to be washed again? How does uh, Daniel uh, put it? Daniel, uh, Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon the people to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make an end of it. Now he's talking about these feasts, these offerings, to make an end of it, to make an end of the Day of Atonement. Make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. This is covenant language. Seal up the vision and prophesy and to anoint the most holy. Oh, there's so much I'd love to talk about that. God the Son would take to himself our humanness, our humanity. Suffer and die as a, and shed the blood of God. He was born of a virgin. Only then, only in that could sin be remembered no more. Now here in this thing, Jesus is both high priest and he's the sacrifice. On the cross, he's, he's there as high priest. He's, he offered himself as the final sacrifice. I think it's funny because if we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, what did Adam and Eve desire? They desired the death of God so that they could take God's place. But in pursuing the death of God, they died themselves. And how did God respond to their rebellion? Love. He placed himself in the hands of the creature, uh, or, or of the creature human. He, God placed himself in our hands and said, Only gay, if you want me to die, I'll do it. This goes all right back to the lie. When Adam said, Hey, we want to be our own God. We don't need you, God. We'll be our own God. God, we wished you would just die. So here he comes and says, you want me to die? I'll do it. What love is this? And as a result of that, we're made alive, forgiven, reconciled. Raised again, seated with him in heavenly places. His precious blood began to be shed in Gethsemane. The time of the great pressure, you know, when he's about to go to the cross, when he's out there, prayer and agony. His sweat becomes great drops of blood. Then he's taken in and begins to be tortured. And I use that word tortured because, you know, we see that he was tortured. Crown of thorns placed them and drove down into a skull, beaten to a pulp, nailed to a cross, finally speared in the side and outflowed blood and water. And in this, God the Son, in our humanity, is making covenant with God the Father because the life is in the blood. The blood that was shed in the making of this covenant was the blood, was the physical blood of God, if you will. God was in Christ. Body prepared. It was both the, the shed blood from his humanity because it all, he, he became us. The blood of our race and also the blood of God as he swore by himself to the terms of of the covenant that he determined to bring to pass. And what did he say on that? His final statement right there. It's finished. The day of atonement. I mean, can you just bring this around? The mighty day of atonement. Wait a minute, this is Passover. Can you see that all these feasts are summed up in one? They're summed up by the fulfillment right here in the cross? The day of atonement, it's finished. Boom, I made an end of it. Behold, the Lamb of God that does what? Cover sin? takes it away. This is what he came to accomplish. 
The shedding of the blood of God in covenant brought the representative, which is Christ, out of death. Now, where are we in all this? We're the Hebrew people, right? We're looking up there and we realize, my God, I'm in him. So if he came up out of death, we came up out of death. So then we go back and read this verse in 13, 20 again. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will. In raising from the dead, now listen to this, and this is what we don't, people just bypass this part. But in raising from the dead, this is what Paul is talking about in Corinthians and in other places. In raising from the dead, he became the declaration that sin that had carried him unto death had been dealt with forever and the death that sin had brought had been swallowed up. Do, do you see that? When Jesus raised from the dead, he's declaring sin is old. Do you, you see what I'm... He was... He himself... That's why Isaiah said he is the covenant. He, he is the announcement that now the terms of the covenant could be fulfilled in us. Now we know every covenant that was... is sealed or is ratified by blood. The new covenant being sealed in the blood of Jesus is no exception. The power of the, of the new covenant is in the Holy Spirit, the authority of the covenant. The Holy Spirit, the authority of the covenant, which declares that it is in full effect. I mean, you, you think about this. The fact that the eternal blood of God has been sprinkled in the heavens is the authority that releases us from sin and ushers into us all the blessings of the new covenant. You remember in uh, Matthew when he says, uh, uh, let's see, Matthew 26 and 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Amplified says this way, which ratifies the agreement. My blood which is shed, which ratifies the agreement. I remember dad used to be in the, you know, with their contract and stuff, and they would say, well, ratify the agreement. Uh, that, the word ratify means to make something fixed, to give uh, formal approval to, and, and, and thereby to validate or make it legally valid with an official sanction. Jesus, Jesus shed blood is what makes the new covenant legally valid with the official sanction of God. And Jesus carries that blood, which is his own blood. Right? Don't forget about the day of atonement. He carries his own blood <coughs> into the center of existence, into the holy of holies itself. And by sprinkling it there, had declared that sin had been dealt with forever, never to be remembered. And that the reconciliation of man to God had been achieved and the new covenant was now valid and in effect. Then he, uh, right here in Hebrews, go back over here, all these other priests standing daily, but this man, this Jesus, once he had done this, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. And this, this verse blows my mind of why people want to build another temple and raise a red heifer and go over to Israel and make another sacrifice and spit in the face of God. If the sacrifice of Jesus didn't get it done, we're all up the creek. If the, because guys, I, I've been around cows and you going to tell me that a stinky old heifer cow is worth more than the precious blood of Jesus Christ? You are crazy. Yeah. You are flat crazy. This man offered one time, set down forever. 
Listen, here, here it is. I'll just read, read this and, and then be done. And he says, which are the figures of the true. See, he's talking about the Day of Atonement. But into heaven itself, carrying his own blood, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must have, have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the world, in the end of that system, that's what he's talking about, in the end of the old covenant system, now he has entered in to put away sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself. See, guys, if we want to apply this into the world to sometime in the future, we're still under sin and condemnation, still under the curse. But he was talking about the end of that system, the end of that Jewish world he entered in. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. That was all the way back in there into the garden. When, when Adam was appointed to die, and there had to be a judgment, there had to be an atonement that was made, right? And he says, after this, the atonement. Adam was judged. What did God do? He provided a sacrifice. And it's appointed unto men who wants to die after this, the judgment. And then we got this last verse. So Christ was once offered, offered one time. To bear the sins of many. That Greek word many means all. Infinite number all. All that ever will be. Christ carried all their sins. Yes, amen. And unto them. Who's them? Them. Us. Us who are sitting there watching that goat. We watch that goat be sacrificed. And now we're just waiting on the high priest to come back out of there. And tell us guys things are alright. Because that's what they did. They wanted to make sure the high priest made it in there and God didn't kill him while he was in there and he got to come back out when he stood there all Israel would be rejoicing because they knew wow our sins are put away to them it was only covered but we can rejoice and say man he did that one time he never has to do it again it is forever done away to them that look for him he shall appear the second time without see unto what salvation what, so what am I referring to as salvation? Does this mean I get a ticket? This means that the barrier, because let me break salvation and tell you this. Salvation is a relationship. So now I can enter into a true relationship, which is salvation, because before I was separated by a veil. But now us two can walk together, hand in hand. Now I can be called the friend of God. Now there's no more separation between me and God. It's all found in Christ Jesus. True, full salvation. This is why Paul said, don't neglect so great a salvation that's been given to you, bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You, you see what I mean? If we could bring salvation over into a relationship and righteousness not meaning I've done good or unrighteous meaning I've done bad, but righteousness meaning we walk side by side. We walk as one. Yeah. You, you see righteousness now? We, 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 we bring righteousness over because our Christian Western world view of, of the churches of a courtroom drama where you done good or you done bad, not as relationship. Right. So righteousness means I kept the laws and I did this, but to a righteousness to the Hebrew men, we're in equal covenant relationship. Amen. We walk together in a binding relationship, married, husband and wife, they become what? One flesh, righteous. You see what I mean? Righteous. Not about deeds, good or bad, because we don't know how to speak covenant language. Covenant language. Now let me just let me just read this over here. We know Jesus, after he offered sin, sat down. And it says, from henceforth, I'm in 1013 Hebrews. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Part of the covenant. Part of the covenant. Wherefore the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them 
their sins and iniquities I will remember. Man, everybody knows that. No more. But we come to God as a little twerpy beggar because we know we sin. We know we've blown it. See, this is the boldness that Paul could come in there with boldness into the throne of God to seek mercy. And see, we've had mercy as being pity. It's not pity. Paul could go boldly in there to seek the loving kindness, the sign of the covenant, no matter what, because he knew it was confirmed by an oath in the bloodshedding of Jesus Christ, and this is rightfully by It doesn't matter what. It didn't matter what, because the covenant representative, it was confirmed. Yes, amen. Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now, where remission of these be, in other words, they're there in the heavens. It's gone. But we got to get this now into you. There's no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. Now, here's, the, here's the boldness. To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You get what this word boldness is? Let me say this. It means to be absolutely unafraid. Now, before I was under the curse because God was over there. There was a sacrifice of blood. I can't approach him because of blood. Now remember, we got this fear of God because we put ourselves in a condition that if God approached us, he would kill us because God is light, and I'm dead now. I'm in this state of death. So if light approaches darkness, it's killed. So God has to stay hid. The only approach for me now is to be covered up into the blood. But now Paul says, now I can come fully into that place. Into the holiest of all. Now wait a minute. I just read over here that the holiest of all, Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. But now Paul is telling me I can enter into heaven itself. Wait a minute. I thought Salvation was a ticket on a spaceship to fly me off to heaven. Paul's saying, my God, you can come boldly in there right now. How, Paul? By a new and living way. What do you mean a living way? Jesus got up from the dead. When he got up from the dead, he was making statement in himself that sin is gone. It's over with. It's done for. I'm raised up from the dead. This is a new and living way which he, Christ himself, had consecrated. Why? For us. He did this. What? For us. For me. He did this for little Jimmy Moore. Do you imagine? I mean, he did this for little Ola Gay. We got to break that part right down into the now for me. That he did 2,000 years ago, he did with me in view. Through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full, 100%, full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an old evil con a conscience trying to bring, you know, we talked about that in our Galatians, that an evil conscience. Our bodies washed with pure water. <laughs> right answers right to Ezekiel. Clean evermore. <coughs> I'll quit right there. Thanks.